welcome back to Prose from the Underground, coming to you from my basement, my new basement, in northern Michigan, where I read, write, think, and say things. I took a bit of a hiatus through the latter half of 2023 so that I could move and get to this new place in the North Woods where I hope to stay forever or darn close to it. So, I have two new interviews coming your way, the first of which is with the mighty Andy Mozina, who is a Michigander and whom I've been reading for years. So Andy has some stories uh, that I think are openly hilarious. He's also a master of something that I would simply call tragic comedy. It's a low, slow burn kind of satire in which we're not asked to laugh openly at someone we dislike. That's uh, for pop culture outlets and other forms of body satire. Uh, Andy's work, especially his new one called Tandem, invites us to laugh or wince at a character we can't help but like despite his major shortcomings. It's a page turner. At the same time, it's emotionally complex as we follow two point of view characters. So tragic comedy in, in many senses, and especially when I read Andy's work, I believe is a, a rather perilous genre. Only the brave undertake it because we're invited to laugh at unsuspecting moments and at ourselves as we get to participate or ride along with a character who's morally flawed. Andy has some interesting things to say about the subgenre as well as his own process and way of coming at the works. I hope you enjoy. Here's Andy. Um, so, without spoilers, I've got a few questions for Andy. Um, we're dealing with two point of view characters here. Uh, the novel toggles back and forth between them. Uh, and they are on contrary sides of a terrible accident. I'll put it that way. So my question, did you ever consider any other point of view uh, structures or strategies, or was this the obvious way to go about this? Yeah, uh, well, first, uh, thanks so much for having me on, on the podcast, I'm a fan. And uh, I gotta thank you again for your help developing this book. Um, so your early, feedback was critical. So I, I so appreciate it. And uh, yeah, the book. Uh, so about the point of views um, there, as you sort of been alluding to, there is uh, sort of a, a, a bad acting character and sort of an anti-hero and there's sort of a victim character. And um, when I first thought about um, uh, and, and I think I, it's OK to say that this novel starts with a drunk driving crash. Um, and when I first thought about writing about that, I I wanted to do both sides of it because um, I think we're used to anti-hero narratives, but we're not as used to um, sort of being with the victim and seeing what their burdens are. So I wanted the novel to be more or less uh, perfectly balanced. And I didn't want a, a loathsome anti-hero. I wanted him to be complicated and I didn't want a perfect victim. I wanted her to be complicated, but I definitely wanted them. I wanted those points of view to balance and speak to each other. Right, right. And I, I will say it's it's one of those reading experiences you, you have when you're in one chapter and you're thinking, holy God, what's the other person doing right now? And so you, <laughs> when the chapter ends, you tear right into the next one to see how how things are going to play out. And it it's posed in a way that I think maximizes uh, the the leaning forward into the narrative, which is- uh, Gosh, that's a nice way to, thank you. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, I think I I didn't plan that, but I did notice something like that happening as, as I was trying to, and it did mean trying to also um, cut redundancy and find ways to allude to things be, so that you, you, you kind of had to, you kind of had to manage it so that you weren't overlapping too much because it was all about the same incidents, sometimes different takes on the same scenes when they were together. Yep. So there was a little bit of uh, finessing to do with that. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. I, I would like to be in your head when you were thinking through that because we don't get necessarily that here's what a person thought about 
this. Here's what B person thought about this. It's it's more protracted, you know. So you get that subtly as you roll through the through the scenes. Um, okay, so you've let uh, at least part of the cat out of the bag. It starts with a drunk driving accident, um, and I I'm glad also so glad to have a, a a character that's not loathsome. I mean, in fact, he's he's um, very likable in all kinds of ways, which is why we can ride along with his. Um, moral problem that develops pretty quickly. Uh, I, I call this a, a moral pressure cooker because um, we get to see the one character who's done something terrifically wrong, keep doing more stuff wrong and keep rationalizing it. Um, so we get to see him create a moral gray area where there, there ain't none. Uh, so talk about that. How in the heck did you um, put yourself in that space? What kind of work was involved in in that moral problem. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting because I thought I wanted to write about rationalization, or I found myself writing about rationalization. I think it's a I think it's a huge public problem where people rationalize bad behavior, and I think it's something to satirize, and I think it's also a very common human failing that I wanted to um, explore. So um, once he, once the crash happens, there is no, I don't think there is much of a book if he, if the cop turns himself in. There's maybe a book there, but I, I didn't, I wasn't as interested in, in that book. So I wanted to figure out, well, how could he rationalize it or how could we stand being with him? And um, when I thought, just purely immersing myself in the moment, how would somebody potentially begin to rationalize it? I stumbled on this idea of him sort of trying to love his way out of it. Him, his, his major rationalization is that I, I, I don't do anybody any good in prison, but I can help people and be a better person outside of prison. And that's obviously super self-serving. Um, and I thought it was interesting to think about somebody who behaves morally well for immoral reasons. And I just, there was something about that paradox that kind of caught me or oxymoron, whatever, that caught me up. So then I started to think through, and then I started to sort of, oh, he's an econ professor and he's got all these uh, cost benefit analysis ways of analyzing situations. And um, so I, I realized I had a rationalizer going and um, I kept wanting to put pressure on his ability to either rationalize away or break and want to confess. Um, and and um, that was one of the central drafting questions too, was how was I gonna resolve that tension? Because I wanted it to be a very real choice at any moment throughout the book. Yeah, yeah, that that's it's great to hear. And it, it feels that way at any moment. Well, not any, but at least right. halfway through for the latter half of the of the novel things could go one way or another at any moment um and you put us right on that edge so many times uh and it's really gratifying um okay so and maybe this is related but i've read uh i i think of course you could have published under a pseudonym but i i've read all the mozinian works that have come along um and, <laughs> uh, consistently you are doing a kind of um tragic comedy, comedy, tragedy. Uh, there is what I call uh, a Mosinian smirk that that works along, even along with, or maybe especially along with the, the tragic moments. Um, and those, the, the smirk comes most with with Mike's uh, point of view, uh, not not Claire. So um, I guess I this is my opportunity now to just get you talking about that. Do you, how yeah. do you think about the, the forces of comedy and tragedy? Uh, do, do they work together for you sort of naturally? Like how there they are again, or is it something that you manage consciously? I think that where tragedy, where comedy and tragedy can meet is, is in the area of satire, which I think of as a humorous critique. Um, and so uh, I think that the way there's a little bit of if I didn't uh, laugh, I'd cry 
when somebody behaves badly and they still can't deal with it um, and the way they rationalize it, um, there can be satirizable humor. You know, there, there can be that type of humor there. Um, I think that there's also the way in which um, complicated situations create absurdity um, where there are things you didn't intend happen. And that also goes very well with bad behavior. You tend when you're behaving badly to create absurdities, to, to get you to the point where you're doing things that are over-motivated by your guilt or over-motivated by your desire to escape accountability. And so you act in ways that are extreme. And I think that also lends itself to humor. Um, and there's a way in which I'm also honoring the tragedy. And that's why I wanted to, um, to put Claire's point of view, the mother of one of the victims, put her point of view in there. So it is, it is delicate because I want whatever humor there is to be um, uh, localized and, and also notice that other things are not funny. And in fact, oddly, um, some of the humor depends on things not being funny, if that makes sense. In other words, um, it's awful and bad to behave this way. And when somebody, and you can satirize when somebody's going there, um, despite everything. Um, so I, and I, and I, I so over, I'm super, I became super conscious of tone and, and exactly what words I would put on this humor. So I'm not, I'm trying not to smirk at Mike. I am trying to poke fun at Mike yeah. at times. Um, and, and Mike is inadvertently funny, but not to himself. Um, if that, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Total sense. And I, I, I want to uh, enshrine that those few minutes uh, that that's really healthy uh, thinking for writers who, who need to deal with these emotional complexities. Um, yeah. I, I feel like one, one of the absolute criteria that, that, that must be in place for me is the narrator can't be um, scorning the, the point of view characters. When I read it yeah. out like that, I'm like, I, I don't buy it, you know? Um, or finger wagging in front of the the point of view characters, and and that doesn't happen here. Uh, but at the same time, there's the classic sort of comedy distance we get um, between yeah. Peter and and Mike, especially um, because uh, as you say, he's over motivated. His guilt is over motivating him, and we get those those passages where we're like, "Dude, no! You get far enough away from someone, you can laugh." Uh, but then wham, we're bright, brought right back up close to him because of his um, tenderness and um, absurd strategy to say, as, as you put it, to love his way out of this. Um, and what a great formula, like try to hate this guy who's trying to, to love his way out of a bad situation. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And that was, I think, partly to go back to your first question about point of view, like third person was for me, the best way to, I love what you're saying about how you're calibrating that distance. And for some reason, first person, for I, not for some reason, for the reason you just sort of explained, I think that's why I couldn't do this in first person. I couldn't be that close. I needed some play. Um, yeah. So uh, this has been great. Uh, I have one final uh, question for you that I, I feel like I have to ask because I know you're, you always have sparks flying. Um, even if you can sort of intimate what you're up to, uh, when the smoke clears from tandem, what's what's next? I'm really not sure. I, I think I'm just going to get back into my process, which is note taking. Uh, I've got a few short stories around. Um, the last two projects I've done have been novels, and I'm almost thinking, do I have to come up with a novel sized idea and uh, I think I do need some smoke to clear before I, um, I know it's very dumb not to have your next book in motion when a book comes out, but um, I don't really have much right now. Um, and so if anybody has any ideas for novels, just email me 
or, All right. or yeah, I will, I'll try to do my best to write those and we, uh, that'll be good. We'll definitely throw ideas. I've got all kinds of things that I would like Andy Mozina to write. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I I very much enjoyed uh, the the story collection quality snacks. Uh, I think I may have even told you that um, uh, I found myself. I, I tend to read at night. And I found myself at two or three in the morning, not just giggling in bed, but just openly laughing, trying to suppress <laughs> like big guffaws uh, when I. <laughs> So anytime you can kick out another story collection, you know, and not not burden yourself with a, a mighty novel, then there'll be people like me on the other side. Wow. Well, that's, that's damn nice of you, John. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Good luck. Everybody go out and get tandem. See you next time. <laughs>